So I'm, we are delighted to, uh, to have uh, Brittany uh, here. Brittany was uh, raised in uh, Colorado, but has called Portland her home since uh, 1990. She holds a, uh, a degree from Reed College where she is also employed, which is not so far uh, up here. She's the poetry editor for the online journal Hyperlexia, poetry and prose about the autism spectrum. Her poems have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, and she's the author of the collection Navigation, 2012, and the chapbook, 40 Weeks, also 2012. So she lives with her husband, Thomas, and their two children here in Portland. And she has a website, which she may tell you a little bit about. But for more information about Brittany, visit her website. Would you join me in welcoming our poet tonight, Brittany Corrigan. Brittany. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. And I want to uh, thank Tom for inviting me to be a part of this series and um, all the friends of the library here in this lovely pond house space. This is great lovely place to read. So um, I'm going to read you um, some pieces from each of the two collections as well as some more recent work. So I'm going to start with a few from uh, Navigation. Um, and it's grouped into um, several sections and the first section is uh, mostly poems about family and family history. So this one, um, my grandmother is Italian on my mom's side. And um, this was written when I was finding out some of her family history. It's called Aqueducts. I have carried water to bed with me every night since I was able to tip a cup to my lips with my own small hands, adopted a cup as my own for years at a time until it was broken or lost. Though it was not the cup that mattered so much as the holding of water, the water keeping watch over the night. Two centuries back, my grandmother's ancestors built the aqueducts in Turin, Italy. My mother tells me this today, and it is the only thing I know of them, the family Audo, a line sunk by the weight of my great-grandfather Grosso, a name as vast and still as the bowl of a reservoir. The names of my great-grandparents, Celestina, Anton, are as far back as I can name, as my mother can name. The stories come to me slowly as water struggling to pass through a dam. I know a few small things, like switchbacking up a hill. That Celestina came to America first, her hands empty of pennies and English. That my grandmother refuses to speak her native tongue, does not speak at all of her life before my grandfather, the war navigator, the architect of her world, who washed over her family name like a flood. I imagine the aqueducts of northern Italy pressed into the landscape by my family's hands, climbing into the city like children into laps reaching for my grandmother's face with small boned hands, the hands my mother used to raise me above her head, the hands in which I carry water, holding it to my lips in the dark night after night. You can do that after every poem, just sigh a little. It's great. <laughs> um, there's also, um, several poems in this section that deal with issues of um, loss of one kind or another. Um, and this one was written for um, my brother-in-law who died um, very young of a, a freak accident. So this one is for him and it's called Birds of Passage. One. You tell me there's a stunned bird on the sidewalk by the high rise, people stepping aside as if it is nothing but a lost tourist. You are on the 18th floor, maybe thinking of the brother you lost, how he visits your sister's rooms, his voice on the wind. You don't know what kind of bird, some sort of hawk, don't know if it flew into a window, fell many stories. Is this how we are with our grief, not knowing building from sky? The police have closed a lane of traffic enough before rush hour that it doesn't make the news. We hope the phone will never ring again to tell us anyone we love has died. By the end of the day, the bird is gone, and I want to know where they've taken it, if wherever it is will ever be safe enough. 
too. Several states away, the smoke of your brother pauses in the air. Another hawk flattens against a window. It is the house next door to your brother's birthplace. No barriers, only reservation stillness. So much sky to choose from. Who is he looking for, forgetting how to pass through walls? We open and close our palms, blow out candles, burn sage in the corners of rooms. The sky must be falling. Stars smack into our windows, storm clouds spill under our doors, and the birds double back on the wind, flying feet forward to land on our shoulders, whisper into our days, we want to tell you something, but we keep losing our way. Three. Four months to the day and another relative dies. We expect a hawk to land on the windowsill knocking. It is said that when someone we love has died, in 12 days will come a sign of safe passage. Now all of us are looking out our windows through our dreams into faces of people we walk past, waiting for the message, hoping they will step out of a crowd calling our names. I got a little surprise this evening. Um, my dad and my stepmom are here from Colorado, and they weren't supposed to be here till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I know, so I'm glad I'm reading this one tonight. So this one, <laughs> this is one of the. There's the second section of the book is mostly poems about place, and a lot of them um, take place in Colorado, where I was raised. Um, and um, I love the rain. I actually still love it after living out here um, for a while, but less so since I had children than I did before I had children. But um, <laughs> they're always scooped up. But um, but Denver's rain is really really different. <clears throat> it's um, the big thunderstorms that happen in the summer are something I actually really miss. So this one is called Denver's Rain. <clears throat> The gutter in front of our house on Glencoe Street had a section wide and deep as the bowl of a pelvis, rimmed with asphalt that softened with the heat, fingered into the cracks of the concrete, steamed and hissed when the rains began. Late summer afternoons in Denver meant thunderstorms, the sky opening up and the full gong of the storm resounding in my five-year-old body. Severe thunderstorm watch. It was still safe to be playing outside with my sister, the hose spreading sheets of water down the driveway and into the big gutter. My mother was still snapping beans on the front porch, silver mixing bowls at her browned bare feet. We could hear the wind leaning into the crabapple tree in the backyard with its moist breath of thunder, the tree rocking in and out of the dark sky and dropping its red fruit. Severe thunderstorm warning, we had to pull everything in, shut off the hose as the sky, cracking, let the first drops fall. We gathered up our cats as our mother collected her beans and moved us into the house. The small TV brightened before us, and we watched the weathermen on Storm Center 4 point out tornadoes, fascinated, secretly hoping one would head for our house. <laughs> My, my mother tried to keep us away from the windows, but we wanted to watch the lightning, count the storm's movement toward us in the seconds between the split and the sky rolling itself whole again. Wanted to watch the big gutter fill until it spilled onto the sidewalk, the water rushing around the block like our dog when he got loose, hail the size of ping pong balls casting the lawn into winter. And we sat in the dark of the house, the crabapple tree losing leaves a season too soon, thinking of the possibilities of mud and bluing skies, the gutter now indistinguishable from the body of the storm. There's seats up here if you want to come up. There's two of them. Come, come. <laughs> a good view. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Now's your chance in between poems. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I spent a very brief period of time living um, in Eugene when my husband law was in law school down there. Um, so this is my Eugene poem, um, which also has Colorado visiting it. So it's called Nests. Well, prose poem is a few of those sprinkled in here. So <clears throat> I am one week into living in this new city set among Oregon's hills in the quiet darkness of woods. 
Deer have visited us. I am hearing crickets again. The stars here seem close and numerous enough to run my hands through. In Colorado, my mother's husband has cleaned out the garage and discovered a box I hid there as a girl, pigtailed tomboy keeping to myself. He sends it to me. It arrives today, and I pull open the flaps of the box, marked in my childish hand, nature's artifacts, handle with care, do not throw away. It is a quiet morning, and I'm taken back to skinned knees and hole-worn keds as I lift bird's nests, petrified wood, river rocks and pine cones, pussy willows, a cocoon, the half-decayed remains of snakes. I line them up across the kitchen counter and remember trips to the mountains, the color of aspen in autumn. Here, my cat brings a garter snake into the house, and I see my ringless girl hands as I pick it up, pinching it behind the head to take it back outside. Last night, an animal fell into our chimney, scattered soot as it tried to scale the, way th the walls to escape. This morning, all is still, and I think of settling into this city where I know no one, shifting bird's nests in my hands, feathers, grass, mud, all woven into a bowl, a home that I found and kept and now has returned to me. Right. <clears throat> so the third section is all um, poems having to do with motherhood and having children. Um, before I had children of my own, um, my sister went first. She's younger than me, but she went first in everything. And, um, and uh, I fell in love with my nephew. So this was written, he's now 15 um, and a half. And um, this was written when he was just a few months old. So this is called Everything. Bah. Bah, bah, means everything. The dog scratching at the door for dinner, and you small, your sight grows longer, longer with each day. Your fingers learn to hold onto everything. Everything has a taste. The dog scratching at the door for dinner. You want to be there when he is fed. Feel his fur in your fingers. Learn to hold onto everything. When the woman who carries you steps out to feed the dog, the dog scratching at the door for dinner, you say, bah, 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 mean everything. Want to be outside with the dog, with the red hair of the woman, with the dog eating his dinner. Everything has a taste, you say, bah, bah, bah. Three teeth coming in, your teeth come in more with each day. Your fingers learn to hold onto everything, you say, bah, bah. And mean the dog, mean where you want to be, outside the door, the woman with the red hair who carries you, holds everything. I wrote that in a workshop with um, Olga Bromas, who was getting us to write poems that repeated themselves <laughs> over and over again. So, she, so that was a great exercise. It got that out. All right. Um, so we have this plant, um, it's called a night blooming cereus, and it's this, it's a succulent, and it's this weird gangly thing with these long tendrils, and it's really kind of ugly and spindly looking, and, um, and we had gotten it as a clipping from a friend, and carried it around for years, and this plant makes these flowers that are about this big around, and incredibly fragrant, and they only bloom at night for one night, and then they're done, um, and we carried this thing around for years, and it did nothing, for years and years and years and years and years, and then, um, and then it didn't. So <laughs> this is what they won't see. Finally, after unspectacular years in the windows of our small string of homes, our night-blooming Sirius is budding. A bud the size of an egg, wrapped in long purpled tendrils muzzling forward to the tip, perched at the end of a thick curving stalk. It is the last week of June in a summer slow to arrive, cast in cloud cover and rain after rain. We are tired, a week of children coughing in their sleep, of night terrors and moving from their bed into ours. But we will stay up to see it open, perhaps tonight, 
perhaps tomorrow, watch the tendrils peel back to reveal feathery white petals, a bird of a blossom spreading its full fragrant body forward into the dark. We don't want to miss it. But also today, I am thinking of what our dead are missing, what they won't see. Their deaths are still close, near enough that our children remember them with equal parts confusion and longing. Sometimes I can accept that they are gone, but not the morning we wake to find our sun has grown taller overnight. Not the day my husband arrives home from a long weekend trip to remark that our daughter is bigger. Her body fills up more space. Her toes reach out farther into the room. Not the times when these children unfurl with their growing. So quickly you can almost see their young arms lengthening toward the sky. And I think, how can they be sleeping our dead? Wake up. Be here to see this. You can't miss this flowering, this bloom. All right. So I'm going to read you some new stuff and then save 40 weeks for last. So. Okay. Newer stuff. This one's actually the newest. Um, my sister is a redhead, like a real, like carrot top redhead, which my father used to be <laughs> in his younger days. So, so I look like my mother, my sister looks like my father, and my, my mother taught genetics um, for a period of time and used to show a picture of my sister and I to our class and not tell them for a while that we were related and then talk about genetics. So um, <laughs> this is called unexpressed. <clears throat> My daughter's hair could have been red, but it wasn't. Brown like mine, not like my sister's, which is red, orange really, not like fire, but like the ripening of pumpkins in an autumn field when the sun sets them aflame, that photographer's light. My mother shows a photograph of my sister and me to her genetics class, doesn't tell them yet that we are sisters, lets them study the dark Italian features of one and the freckled Irish ginger of the other, and then tells them. Yes, they are sisters. Yes, identical DNA. See, they have the same nose. Look closely. <laughs> My son's hair could have been red too, but it's not. Though he did get the freckles, they've surfaced year by year in his snowy face like crocuses in spring, dappling the skin of his cheeks, the slopes of his nose. My daughter's freckles you could count on one hand, there on her back, and another there in the soft fur of her small arm. He looks like his uncles on my husband's side, they say. They say she looks just like you. Her eyes, they say. His eyes, they say. Look, they are yours. That deep brown like the flank of a horse glistening in the sun. Not blue like my sisters, though they could have been. Not blue like the sky in summer, warming the horse's back as she stands in a field of clover, every leaf the same and tripled until you look closely and find the one that has four. So. <clears throat> my daughter's six. And um, when she first started losing her teeth, we started talking about the, the tooth fairy. And her version of the tooth fairy is different than mine, so... This was inspired by that. <clears throat> uh, falling teeth. My daughter, five, seesaws her first loose tooth. Small, slick finger hooking, tongue pressing at the new, larger tooth blooming behind. Excitement lifts from her face like spores into wind, alights on everyone she tells her secret to. We lean together, imagine what the tooth fairy must do with all the teeth. Her fairy, surely pink-gowned, awash with glitter, bedecked with wand and bells, shapes jewelry and studs her combs, collects teeth in rows of dainty boxes, decoupaged with flowers, padded in velveteen. <laughs> My fairy is more twigs in her hair, fay, barefoot, dark-skinned, shimmering limbs circled in vines. Winged and sounding like autumn in dappled sunlight, flourished with birds. 
She revels in the macabre, grinds teeth to powder to rub into her skin. Teeth dangle everywhere, a many-looped necklace quivers at her breast, clattering wind chimes entangle in her garden. Teeth nestle with tree roots and mouse bone filigree to form the arcing mosaic around her door. My pixie-haired girl child wiggles and worries the tooth, first with constant attention, then gradually without notice. She draws elaborate castles with her left hand, one right finger working the tooth as it teeters and clings. After the mother lost moment of disbelief that my daughter is old enough to lose a tooth, I go back to the horrific and raw. They come often the dreams of falling teeth. Teeth crumble on mass or drop out in slow motion one by one or I touch them and they peel from my gums, slip through my fingers, tumble down and away. Dreams of falling teeth, common, are always about fear, aging, uglification, survival, what we reach for, devoured. My daughter at the table, colors spreading out before her in wild, bright lines. I can hear the fairy's breath as she hovers nearby, stalking her next pebbled prize. Whether rose-satined or mossy-toed, it is all the same. She took mine, she'll take my daughter's, she'll take mine again. I smile to taunt her, pass my tongue over each firm stone, root in as she shifts her gaze. She jangles coins in her pocket, choosing what she'll leave behind. My daughter holds up her drawing, wobbly tooth flashing as she grins, and the sunlight from the window filters through. All right, so I hope nobody is snake squeamish. Um, I love snakes. Um, <laughs> you can go like this for three minutes if you <laughs> um, <laughs> so, no, see, so I had a fourth grade teacher who was really um, into snakes, and she gave us all a real appreciation for them, and I, they're really misunderstood. And um, one of the highlights of my, my week um, is feeding our corn snake, um, because the neighborhood kids who are often over playing our house on the weekends are running, who's ever running through will stop, and they, it's fascinating, and they want to watch the snake eat, and it's a great opportunity to educate them about how really cool <laughs> this animal really is. So. Um, this is feeding the corn snake. I don't really do this for two minutes if you don't. Um, she eats mice, the frozen kind that come individually wrapped in a box from the pet store, and we defrost one each week and warm it in water so that it feels almost alive. It has fur and a bitty tail and a little smear of blood around its mouth. My five-year-old daughter, who loves all tiny living things, coos at its fuzzy closed eyes. Hello, mousy. You're a big mousy. You're so cute. Though she knows it is dead. And I'm startled at every feeding that she never thinks to cry. We have to trick the snake, her coral eyes alert in her bright, rippling, fire-patterned skin. We hold the mouse by the tail with tweezers, jiggle it in front of the snake until she grabs it by the face. And then we mock a struggle, making the mouse body thrash and pull, though its paws hang limp and cannot fight as the snake unlatches her jaw and pulses the whole head in. Then we just watch. It is incredible every time. As the mouse, which seems impossibly large for the snake's slender form, disappears bit by bit into her mouth, her whole body undulates with the effort, until all we can see is the tail dangling out, and then the tail is replaced by the snake's flicking tongue. My daughter, all circle of life in her matter-of-factness, now talks to the snake. Hi, Ember. Aren't you pretty? Wasn't that delicious? You're a good snake. <laughs> and the snake, named for her glowing colors, the glint in her eyes, regards us gently, curling in on herself, the bulge of mouse moving slowly to her center. All right, Ember, you take a nap now. Mama, what is there to eat? <laughs> <laughs> Happened just like that. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> oh, so Tom mentioned that I um, I work at Reed. I was also a student there in the 90s, but now I work there um, in the events department. And um, 
Um, I love my job. My job is getting to work with the faculty members bringing um, the speakers to campus, the public lectures to campus. Um, and one of my favorites that I've done was when we um, brought an astronaut. And we brought him accidentally because Na NASA called us and said, there's astronauts coming to town and he hears you have a good physics department. He wants to come to read and do something. And it got handed to the bio department and they handed it to me. So we brought this astronaut. So um, and he was he was very astronauty, so um, <laughs> in a good way. So this is um, meeting the astronaut. <clears throat> the International Space Station is only 200 miles above Earth, but the flight to reach it takes days. Two orbits careening their various bulky bodies, sliding across each other until they align exactly, machine meeting machine almost improbably in the vastness of black, though below on earth the audible breaths release from the mathematicians' mouths. Imagine the astronaut, square-jawed and handsome, tall in his flight suit, blue-eyed and smiling, leather jacket slung over one shoulder. Seriously, it's like that. <laughs> now try to imagine him weightless, anchored umbilically to the station's hulk, globe-headed and thick-gloved, negotiating each small valve and bolt made unfathomably difficult to turn or unturn. Imagine him unmoored from everything that holds the rest of us unrelentingly to ground. To become an astronaut, you must be able to get along with anyone. You must be able to crouch in a cramped, dark space and not have your heart rate soar. You must be able to endure the upending, the spinning, the crush, the dizzy sickness, the distance from home. And also, after you float weightless above the earth, you must return and be able to shake hands with all the starry-eyed humans to tell us what it was like up there, to help us see it, because we want to know we want to feel it. When we grasp your hand, we want our bodies to lift from the earth and rise. <clears throat> so um, one of my side projects at Reed is that there's a, a colony of feral cats on campus. And, um, and they live right outside my office, and so I um, I took it upon myself to capture them all one by one and spay and neuter them, and they, I'm rather attached to them, and I made a deal with the guy who um, does the restoration efforts in the canyon, our natural wildlife habitat on campus, that really if I took care of them, they were going to not kill the birds, and it was going to be okay. Um, so, um, but of course, they're cats, um, and they do kill birds once in a while. So, um, But the first time I saw one of my kitties uh, get a bird was the week of the Boston Marathon bombings. And, um, I say this every time I read this poem, but I, one of the things I like about um, poetry is that sometimes those little moments that happen in our lives allow us in poetry to talk about, or in anywhere, to talk about the larger things that we have trouble talking about otherwise. So this is uh, Stellar's J, the week of the Boston Marathon bombings. The young cat whose life I saved carries a Stellar's J in his mouth, the blue form limp on either side of his jaws. He runs, tail bristled and tabby fur, a wild brown streak into the azaleas. The red of the azaleas, the blue of the bird, almost beautiful, until the jay's mate dies after them in a cacophony of grief and bravery and alarm. And now a ghost jay settles on my shoulder. I am in part responsible for this rending. Some woman births the murderer, the shooter, the bomber, the one who shatters lives like a shockwave pulsing from his center as he walks into this classroom, that theater, this crowd. Maybe someone tried to save him. Maybe someone tried to patch him up, fed him a good meal, raised him up into the world with her hands. She would still run to him now, still gather him into her arms, rock him like a child, no matter what is lashed to his chest, no matter what he has done, no matter what he still may do. My young cat is just a cat. He is supposed to hunt. He is supposed to take lives daily, licking his snout and preening his fur. But on this day, 
My heart presses wildly at the walls of my chest as the J-mate whirls and paces the air, screeching, crying. Somewhere below him in the azaleas, the she-bird is broken open by a creature I tended and released. Somewhere behind him in the trees, the little jays call from their nest, their blue mouths open, the blue sky falling all around them through the leaves. Um, and then in a recent workshop with them, um, not that recent, a year or so ago, a couple years ago, um, with Maxine Skates, who was a visiting poet at Reed several different times, um, and including while I was there, um, I took another workshop with her a couple of years ago, and she had us bring a poem to the workshop in advance that we'd written in advance, and we read it and worked on it the first day, and then it was a weekend workshop. And the, then that night, she gave us the assignment of writing about the same basic subject matter in a persona poem to try to get at it from a different angle. Um, so, which I was fascinating, and when I was at Reed, um, the senior thesis that I wrote was a, um, I did a creative thesis, I wrote poetry, and almost all of them were persona poems looking at transformation in fairy tales and mythology. So it was nice to go back. Now I'm sort of going back and revisiting persona poems again. So I'm going to read you two of those before I read you the 30 weeks poems. So um, I've been wanting to write about Sylvia Plath for a long time, um, um, and then even more so after I had children. So um, this is Sylvia's explanation. And it's got, you can't, it's hard for me to be able to show it to you, but each stanza has um, a line of hers in it from Ariel. So I don't know if you'll catch it or not going through, but they're, they're in there, one in each stanza. Sylvia's explanation. I never meant to be gone so long. I only wanted to lie with my hands turned up and be utterly empty. It was just there was so much tending, your small bodies coiled into my sides for warmth. It was so cold, and none of us could sleep for the coughing. See how these papers crackle, how this pen drags. I never could seem to avoid imagining disaster, playing out a scenario in my head, a child struck by a car or taken by sickness or pulled from my hysterical groping arms. Gray birds obsess my heart. But it was always so I could gather you back to me. You were supposed to make me happy, make me whole. I never expected to lose my way. I had meant to go into the wardrobe. This was London, after all. It should have been possible. On the other side was quiet snow, the light from a single lamp post, and the waiting woods. I simply cannot see where there is to get to. It's bedtime. I think I'm supposed to be telling you a story. I never intended the harm of it. See how I love you. It is night. You are sleeping. Each of you perfected feet to the stars. Here are the glasses of milk, the portions of bread you will find when you awaken. My Hansel and Gretel, if you stay here, you will be safe. The window is open. The door is closed. The gaps are stuffed tight. I never wanted you to see this. I was looking for the wardrobe door. Do not wander into the woods with me. Do not be coaxed into the oven. I thought to go for just a little while back to the place I see now I could never get back to. Sweetly, sweetly, I breathe in. It is so quiet here. What hush. But oh, when I lay my head down, how I hear you crying. All right. So... All the persona poems I've been doing um, lately are all from different mothers' perspectives. So um, my son went through a period of time. Um, my son's on the autism spectrum. I didn't read you any of the autism poems tonight. There's quite a few of those in the book, too. But um, so he, And he goes through these phases where he's really, really interested in one thing intensely. And for a while, it was Peter Pan. And um, I had never seen anything other than the Disney version of Peter Pan. We read the original, and... The original is really fascinating. So 
Um, so this was inspired by a reading uh, the original Peter Pan. <clears throat> Lost boy, Peter Pan's mother has her say. Flight isn't actually born of happy thoughts, no matter what he'd have you think. It's like two magnets that repel, so similar they fly from each other if they come too close. That's how he learned to star step. We began to rub against each other like tinder and flint, sparks flung aloft and his body buoyed up by the heat. He told you he fell from his pram, that I closed the window? Listen, it wasn't that simple. Doesn't every boy sit up in the dark and call out from his dreams? He says he doesn't need a mother, yet he's drawn to countless mothering things. They all want to tend him. Take the fairy. She knows she can't seduce, so instead she claims him. She protects, jealousy lighting her from within, so bright it's audible. She warns. She lays down her life in front of his. Or the mermaids, their fishy bodies draped across his lap, raising and lowering their eyelids like chum to draw him up and out. But I ask you, where are they when the tide comes in, when he puffs out his chest and the water crests his heels? And the never bird, what kind of mother is she, offering her floating nest for rescue when the mermaids abandon him in the middle of their kelp stink lagoon? All those days adrift with her passenger eggs, feathers spread to shelter them from the sun, long necks stretched up and out to threaten the rain, how could she trust my wild and crowing boy with their two fragile forms? What if the tarpaulin hat had not been at hand to receive them? Would he have left the eggs on the wave-drenched rock and sailed back to his rowdy den of boys? Then there's Wendy, all shadow-stitching medicine and stories, playing at motherhood as if it could give her wings. Stroking my boy's hair when the night terrors take him, pressing his head full of baby teeth into her nightdress, thimble kisses falling from his pockets and rolling across the earthy root-torn floor. He pretends not to need any of them, but his dreams turn him inside out, hook-handed and savaged, while my window shutters bang against the house, rain soaking the bedclothes, curtains flapping like the sails of a shipwreck as the last of the pirates burble and siphon down. Who says I can tidy his mind, smooth out his dreams? A mother is just another kind of shadow. A mother is just another kind of star. But for now, he is sleeping. I can wander my fingers through his hair and spy on his dreams. I cannot tame them. I cannot stitch him back to me when the nightmares come. Sweet boy, tonight I've left the window open. You can fly, my darling. You can fly. If you, so I, that's a fairly, like, that poem's still kind of undergoing some revision because it has so many references in it. So you can let me know if you were like, whoo, because I'm not sure. There was so much in that, in that original story of Peter Pan that I don't know if anybody remembers. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to end with a handful of poems from 40 Weeks. Um, so this um, is a book of week-by-week -week pregnancy poems. And when I was pregnant with my daughter, or with my son, First, I decided um, that I was going to write a poem every week of my pregnancy while I was pregnant about what was going on that week. And I wrote week four when I found out, and I wrote week five, and then I got really tired. And I didn't write again um, until he was about two years old. So, <laughs> so um, then, then I had a, a residency at Soapstone um, writing retreat for women when I was um, pregnant with my daughter, which allowed me to go back to the project um, and finish it up. So I'm just going to read a handful of these, but they're, um, they're little tiny things. They're in these little couplets, um, and they go week by week, so I'll give you a little smattering of them here. Five weeks. This is the week the heart starts beating. Little bird, little lizard, little princess pea. Small round stairway of spine, small cleft body, small ache in my belly. Everything moves over, my insides rearrange. The heart starts beating, my insides rearrange. Eight weeks. You are my little skeleton, your toes beginning to number, your sand assembling to bone. You have elbows. 
I hear your heartbeat for the first time, a quick swish swish of liquid into matter. You are bathing your new bones. I am bathing you between mine. 11 weeks. Your tiny form is half head, follicles forming on your soft scalp. You are growing fingernails and toenails, sprouting like a planted thing. Under your closed lids, your eyes begin to color deep and earthy or storm-kissed sky. My eyelids tremble in sleep. I dream an unfolding dream. 16 weeks. Waiting for the quickening, those little knocks and bumps, a new rendering of Morse code, our own body language. You're learning to control those opalescent limbs. Little dragonfly, my hummingbird, you hover at my center, looking for the place to wingbeat your first hello. 18 weeks. Little frog, there are pads now on your fingers and toes, and on those fingertips, whorls of skin map their lines. Ten little starry nights uniquely your own. You can suck your thumbs, taste these new autographs. I imagine the thousand roads your life may take. 23 weeks. Little nymph, your skin is like dragonfly wings. Everything below is visible, illuminated through your shimmering limbs. Your blood travels in quick rivers beside sapling bones. Your heart is a small red poppy fluttering in a field of rain. 25 weeks. Little cricket, now your bones are beginning to harden. You are less insect, less sea thing, less star. The rope ladder of your spine settles its swaying, ossifies into 33 rings. You change from comet dust to earth, body firming like a coral garden. You orbit my center, the beckoning flower, the bright anemone, the warming pool of my inner sun. 30 weeks. Little one, now you know the inside of my body better than I do. You have charted the flesh of my belly, explored every inch. You hear every bodily sound, know the dark of my organs, the light of my bones. You have tasted and touched what makes me whole. You know the rhythms of my heart. 36 weeks. We are becoming a wishing well, you and I. My body is made of carefully placed stones. My heart is open to flickering sky. Little brave one, you are suspended at my center. Together, we are lowering you down, down, down. You settle into my pelvis. You wait for me to wish. The waters are calm and expectant. I am always thirsty. 40 weeks. It is like I have always known what to do. Of course, this is how it feels. The pain, the heat, the profusion of fluids and fears, the breath, the body, the hands on my body, your heartbeat thrums, thrums, thrums. Head, shoulders, fingers, toes, and a voice that makes the world stop spinning just for a moment to welcome you home. Little impossible being, little baby. I always knew it would be you. Thank you. So we, we get to do questions if you have questions. <laughs> so. uh, I've seen a lot of uh, epileptic fits in the kind of work that I did, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody has ever described it so intensely as you have. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping uh, if you would indulge me and us and read the poem to your sister. Mm. Yeah, sure. It's, it's stunning the first time you say it. You just simply describe it. Yeah. Oh, it's called for my sister who has epilepsy. That one, right? Yeah. <clears throat> the voices you were hearing when you were small, redheaded, 
freckled like a pale sky when the stars slip away into the mouth of morning were real voices, knocking at your eardrums like a filling moon or the faint music box or the soft fingering of a branch on a window. They were whispers from deep within your skin, deep in your hair, your heart, your eyes, and you tried to listen to them, tried so hard you almost forgot as you grew the sound of your own voice. But the language was foreign, the words all wrong, and you thought you might be one of those mad women who scrape themselves with their own fingernails, count their freckles unceasingly, or stare into the air at nothing but the voices inside their heads. When the twitching took you, great shuddering of limbs, in the long red-haired world of your womanhood, the voices were screaming and sobbing, burrowing and shaking themselves out of your skin, your folded tongue, the rolling whites of your eyes. When you were small and choking on a piece of orange while our mother worked at your belly like a piston, fisted your back in calm terror, I stood and watched, my hands at my throat, imagining a scrap of orange meat there until the one in your throat was forced onto the floor at my feet, your voice falling out after it in screams and sobs. So when the twitching took you in its seizure arms, I, who was far away, could picture you there on the floor, your boyfriend on the telephone to the hospital and our mother, while you thrashed and vibrated in your own private earthquake, the voices so loud, so confusing, or perhaps all at once so clear and understood, sirens, lifelong prescriptions, and the ensuing silence. I never read that one, so thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. That, um, I'm glad I got it right in some way because I, I never saw her have a seizure. I wasn't there. I was away at college. Um, and what I linked it to was what I vividly remember from childhood was, was her choking on that orange. And that's what it took me back to, that fear about it. And that, so, yeah. So, anything. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> when do you write? <laughs> what's, your writing, what's your writing practice or discipline? Well, so now it's really scattered. It used to be a lot more regular, but now with, with two kids who are 6 and 10, one of whom has autism, and then um, working full-time, um, now I just write wherever I can fit it in. So I carry a lot of poems around in my head, or I carry an idea for a poem around in my head for a long time, and then I kind of sit down and write all at once. <laughs> so whenever I can, whether it's my lunch hour or whatever. And um, uh, I saw Lu Lucille Clifton read, actually it was at Reed, um, once years ago. And she somebody asked her about writing post-children. And why it was, somebody asked her why her poems were so short. And she said that it was because that was all she could carry around in her head. So mine aren't all that short, but I do that. I, carry, I have to carry it around in my head for a long time. And then I get the time to focus on it. So... Um, so my practice is not as regular as it used to be before I had kids. It's harder to fit it in. Yeah. Yeah. When did you know that you were going to be a poem reader? That it, oh, that's um, when I was like, <laughs> my dad can attest that I've been writing poems since I was a little kid. So I don't know that I ever like felt like I knew that it was something I was going to do. I just thought kind of always did it. So from the time I was little, although I went through a period of time um, somewhere in middle school where I stopped writing altogether and um, and the person the book is the navigation is dedicated to is my 10th or 11th grade English teacher as it was his expository writing class that sort of woke me up again <laughs> so I started writing it so there was a little hiatus in there but for the most part I've just always I'm glad you done it, it up again. yeah <laughs> so, well I came to read because I wanted to do biology I was going to be a marine biologist for the longest time and it lasted all of one semester <laughs> right back to English no one was surprised at all so yeah but, yeah so <laughs> yeah when you write do you work on them out loud because when you read yeah. it sounds definitely yeah, they do work on them out loud. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and I like reading them because they're meant. Yeah, they're meant to be read out loud. So, yeah. <clears throat> Does well, if there are any more questions, uh, thank you all for being here. And Brittany has books. Mm -hmm. the books here. There's books. She'll be around mm -hmm. to, uh, for conversation and to yeah. uh, have books. There's some uh, refreshment. Please help yourself. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.